Thanks for joining us today. I'm Varn Shriram with Generation UCAN, and we are thrilled to have Dr. Mike Roussel with us, the nutrition advisor for both Shape and Men's Health Magazine. Dr. Mike, thanks for being with us today. Yeah, thanks for having me. So Mike, today's topic is nutrition hacks to get lean, and you're really a great guy to help us weed through the facts and the fiction that's out there uh, by providing us with science-based information. And really, that's what you're known for, Mike, not only science-based information, but also simplifying the science so it's easier to understand and implement into your own life. Uh, but before we really dive deep into our topic today, Mike, um, give us a little bit of your background in nutrition. Uh, where did the passion for nutrition come from, and, and what's some of the experience you've had working in nutrition? Yeah, you know, so I've been, um, I've been really, really fortunate to do a wide variety of things in nutrition. Um, as you, as all the attendees can kind of see by these slides, I put together just kind of a handful of slides of some different things that I've been able to do over the last several months. Um, you know, I really started out. I got my. I started out actually in medical school, and I, um, I had a degree in biochemistry. And I went straight to medical school after, um, after finishing my undergraduate. And I was there for about a year or so, and just found that like medicine just really wasn't wasn't my passion. There wasn't the nutrition in medicine like I had been planning, and there was there was a lot of red tape, um, and it just wasn't what I expected. Which I think you know when you get into anything, uh, you don't really know what it is until you get into it. And so then I decided that I really wanted to follow my passion for nutrition, and I went and I got uh, applied to graduate school, went to Penn State, got my PhD in nutrition, and was there, uh, ran a, a clinical trial and participated in a handful of clinical trials while I was at Penn State, and then, um, and then just kind of started out on my own after graduating, and I started my own consulting company and started working with, with people, started working with athletes, uh, started doing a lot of freelance writing, I wrote a book. Um, I've written uh, about five books now in the last um, eight or nine years, and you know we'll talk about kind of one of them most recently. And so I'm um, I'm really fortunate to do a wide variety of things in nutrition now, from communicating nutritional science. Um, I write a column for Men's Health Magazine, as you can see in the picture here. I've done some consulting with the Memphis Grizzlies. I do a lot of continuing education work for physicians, dietitians, personal trainers, um, you know, all kinds of people that interface, all kinds of professionals that interface with people. Um, you know, on a on a day to day basis with regards to their health, and uh, and I'm just I'm I'm so excited and, and I love the work that I do. When it comes to your overarching nutrition philosophy, uh, specifically regarding fat loss and getting lean, Mike, um, how would you sum it up in simple terms, if if that's possible? Yeah, so you know, I think I would summarize kind of my nutritional philosophy in and you know, kind of this this statement on the uh, on the screen here is you know how can we create the greatest metabolic capacity for fat loss within the context of what a person is willing to do so when I look at nutrition I, I see it as two kind of distinct things the first thing is the actual nutritional science right like how do you what is the what are the nutrition like what are the macronutrients that you need the proteins carbohydrates fats what are those things that you need in order to get to your goal right so that's like the food part and then the other part I call food logistics so what is it that you actually have to do in order to get that food that you, that's going to maximize whatever your outcome is? So, and I think that people generally don't look at the two of them together. So kind of the nutritional science and then these food logistics. And if one is missing, then you have a really hard time, you know, kind of getting the results and getting the goals that you want. So then, you know, we look at this idea of metabolic capacity, right? And so I look at metabolic capacity as these four components, and we're going to talk about two of them today in the course of this webinar. So the first one would be a high metabolic flexibility. And so this is basically your body's ability to switch from uh, protein, or excuse me, from glucose as a fuel source to fat as a fuel source. And it's really predictive of your ability, actually it's predictive of your ability, uh, of your risk for diabetes over time. But I also find that people who are athletic and really into fitness, it, it's predictive of your ability to be able to perform, you know, when you're tired, when you're fatigued, when you haven't had access to fuel, and and so that's really key. Um, you know, you want high levels of insulin sensitivity is another thing that we'll talk about on the webinar too. And you know, insulin sensitivity is basically at your at the most basic level, it's your body's ability to you know to process and use carbohydrates. And if you're able to do that really efficiently you're going to be able to be, you know, leaner, more muscular, eat more carbohydrates, eat more foods. And it's really kind of a, you know, it's really a great thing. Um, 
Then the next piece is this elevated relative calorie balance. So, you know, basically people like to eat as much as they can, right? And so with this, you know, with this elevated relative calorie balance, if you can eat a lot of calories and burn a lot of calories, then that's going to put you in the best position metabolically. So an example of this would be if I could eat 3,000 calories a day and burn 3,000 calories a day, my caloric balance would be would net out to be zero, right? I'm, I'm eating exactly what I'm burning. But if I do that 3,000 calories versus if I was doing that at 2,000 calories, so eating 2,000 and burning 2,000 and was weight stable, I'd be leaner and I'd be more metabolically you know, effective at that higher level. So how do we get people to be able to eat more food and burn more calories throughout the day? I think that's a really important key. And then the last piece is this high position on the constrained total energy expenditure curve. And we'll talk about this like at the very end, but it, it again goes back to this idea of eating a lot of calories and burning a lot of calories. And it, it really puts you in a great metabolic position versus where actually I find a lot of people, especially if you're struggling with fat loss, that what you end up doing is you're progressively cutting your calories down lower and lower and lower. And as a result, your body's becoming more and more and more efficient and it becomes harder and harder and harder to lose weight. And we really want to avoid that. And I think especially when you're looking at long-term weight loss, this is a, you know, it's a big problem. So great, Mike. So with all that, you know, great uh, background on, on your experience in nutrition and also some of the uh, fundamental nutrition principles that are going to guide our discussion today. Um, so to set up what Mike's going to be sharing with us here over the next 45 minutes or so, um, we're going to start with a primer on the MetaShred diet. Mike's going to tell us what it's all about and um, kind of share with us how the MetaShred diet can help you optimize your fat burning ability. Uh, we're then going to talk about insulin sensitivity and blood sugar control. Michael then teaches about the concept of metabolic flexibility, what it means and why it's important, uh, it's important to achieve. And then finally, uh, my favorite, we're going to bust some nutrition and fat loss myths. So Mike's going to give us, uh, you know, give us the lowdown on some uh, fact or fiction with some popular nutrition myths out there. Um, and finally, you know, if uh, there is an opportunity at the end, if we don't run out of time, we hope to have uh, at least be able to pose a couple questions from the audience to Mike. So if you do have any questions, please do share them along the way and we'll do our best to, uh, to pose them to, uh, to Mike um, towards the end of the session. So Mike, uh, take it away. All right, awesome. So, uh, so first we'll get into kind of the MetaShred diet, and you know, as you had mentioned earlier, the MetaShred diet was, uh, or I mentioned the MetaShred diet was uh, the book that I most recently had published um, in January, and it's a rapid fat loss diet. But I feel like it actually encompasses a lot of my nutritional philosophies kind of all into one place. And if you look at kind of the most basic level, I feel like there are three important components or, or three guiding principles with the MetaShred diet. And so the first one is that it's not about just total calories and it's not about type of calories that it's about, you need to find the balance between the total amount of calories you're eating and then the type of calories that you're eating. And so in, in nutrition and, and weight loss, it often fall, you know, people fall into two camps, right? That it's calories in calories out. That's what matters the most, or it's calories in calories out. Doesn't matter. It's all about the foods that you're eating and the hormonal effects of food. And, you know, controlling insulin, that's, you know, really the, the low carb crew falls into that, that category. And, you know, the Metashred diet, what I, what I did and kind of my overall philosophy here is that, that both matter. Like you need to control calories, but that we also, at the same time, we need to respect the, you know, the parts of our, you know, the, the components of the food that we eat that have metabolic consequences, right? Like eating protein and eating fat, it does different things to the body. So those are, you know, the, that's kind of a foundational principle. And so, so three examples here on the screen. Um, I have, you know, some UCAN, uh, beef, and olive oil, right? So if you look at, you know, UCAN is a carbohydrate at the most basic level, but we, I have a couple slides later on to show that there's a very different hormonal profile after you consume UCAN versus if you were to consume maltodextrin, which for all intents and purposes is basically just glucose, right? So same type of thing, right? Carbohydrates, four calories per gram, but a much different hormonal response to when you eat that. So it's going to have a different impact on your body's ability to burn fat, which I'll, which I'll show you, which is, you know, really interesting. And then the next part is, is beef. So if you look at beef, which is a, uh, you know, a protein full of essential amino acids versus olive oil, which is the other, the other thing on the screen, both things, right? If you were to eat an equal amount of calories of the two, you would have very different effects, right? Protein has the ability to stimulate uh, muscle building, has the ability to stimulate muscle protein synthesis, Fat does not. 
Protein is more satiating because of its ability to control ghrelin, the hunger hormone, and increase CCK, which is a, a satiety hormone, right? Fat does not have an impact on ghrelin. Well, it, it still will stimulate CCK. So they're very different, you know, they're different from a calorie perspective, and they're different from a perspective of how they actually impact your body, right, and impact you hormonally. So I think we really need to, to have a, like an all-encompassing and, and comprehensive approach to nutrition we really need to respect kind of all aspects of that food, of food. And then the other piece, you know, with, with MetaShred and with the MetaShred diet, which I talked about a little bit earlier about food logistics, is the MetaShred diet is very scripted. So you're, they're on very specific, you have very kind of specific meal plans, and then you pick the meals that you want to eat in that meal plan. So I call it a modular meal plan. So you're allowed to mix and match the meals that you like, and, and you skip the meals that you don't like. And, uh, and so it makes it very easy from an execution standpoint. So, th so those are really kind of the keys to the MetaShred diet plan and really the kind of the foundation of, of my nutrition. Uh, Mike, when we, we talk about in the context of the MetaShred diet, um, that last slide you just shared on, on it being a scripted plan, um, you talked about working with, you know, everybody from personal trainers and fitness professionals to NBA athletes to just average people trying to lose weight. Um, how much does that scripted element of a nutrition plan in, in your experience help uh, people with compliance and, and get the results they want? So the more you can script your diet, the better you're going to get results. Because I've seen over, the, over my years as a nutrition consultant that it's when you try to execute your diet plan in the context of real life, that's when you run into trouble, right? It's, it's all of a sudden when you have to go to work and your meeting runs over and you can't go to the restaurant you were planning to get the meal you were supposed to, that that's really when you run into trouble. And so if you're, and, and especially then if you're planning to go to some restaurant and then you're just going to pick whatever food you want on the fly, then you're really in trouble. So what, what you need to do and why scripting works so well is it takes the decision making out of food. So there's this whole concept of decision fatigue, right, which is the more decisions you have to make the more it kind of wears at you and your, and your ability to make good decisions as time goes on decreases. And there's some really interesting research and studies that have been done on, on this concept. And so with scripting and, and you know, with some of the kind of higher level um, clients I'm able to work with, some of the executives and the professional athletes, that's what I do. I literally script it to the gram. There, there are clients who I have, I have scripted every, almost everything, I would say 95% of everything they've consumed in the last two to three years, right? Depending on how long we've been working together. Whereas the chef will come, a chef will come up with a menu. I plug that into nutrition software and tell them exactly how much of it is. The chef makes the food and then, it, and then, and then sent, gives it to the client, right? They eat the food and we get the results. And so, you know, that is like the extreme example, but it works really well because it makes the execution part so easy. That's really fascinating to hear to hear that um, it, you know and, and kind of apply that across um, all different types of, of people. Now, Mike, you know our, our next topic: um, optimizing insulin sensitivity and blood sugar control. Um, this is something interesting. You know, this is something certainly that that I know you from being in the nutrition world certainly have been you know awakened to up probably your entire career. But uh, you know, more and more in the mainstream, um, I feel like over the last few years this is something that's starting to be emphasized or, or, or people, you know, without even diabetes are starting to, to consider and think about blood sugar and insulin control. So, you know, before you dive into this, I guess um, one thing I would just ask you is how important is it for everybody to be aware of controlling their blood sugar and, and, you know, be aware of their insulin um, regardless of whether or not they have diabetes. So I think, you know, optimizing your insulin sensitivity and controlling blood sugar is, is probably the most important thing that you can do, uh, you know, for your diet and for your health. And I can say that is, you know, how I, how I really got involved or how I really got enamored by nutrition was when I was a, um, well, I, I was into it all through college because I was kind of into bodybuilding and fitness and weightlifting, but how I really got involved in the, in, in interested in the science side and carbohydrate restriction specifically had to do with, um, I was a senior in college taking a biochemistry class and my, in, and it was through in the chemistry department. So it was like hardcore biochemistry and the chemistry professor, this guy named David Craig, who was like just a great guy. He was, he was a riot. And when we were learning about uh, glucose metabolism and we were learning about fatty acid oxidation, he put himself on the Atkins diet and he would come into class and he would weigh himself every day 
and he would measure his ketone levels and he would graph it you know for the class and we would literally discuss the biochemical changes that were happening in his body with you know what we were learning about fatty acid oxidation and glucose metabolism and so that really kind of got me turned on to the whole thing because it just makes so much sense carbohydrate restriction you know at, at any level just makes a lot of sense biochemically and then um you know and then kind of what really one of the things that really pushed me into studying nutrition was actually I read, you know, the zone diet by Barry Sears. And he, again, kind of further emphasized this concept of, you know, uh, blood sugar control and controlling insulin and how insulin was a gateway hormone to so many things. And for me, that was kind of like the gateway drug into the science of, of nutrition. So I really think that, you know, and I have my whole career in nutrition that controlling insulin and controlling blood sugar is the most important thing that you can do for optimizing your health, optimizing body composition, optimizing performance, kind of anything you want to do, you know, with nutrition. Awesome. Well, with that, um, it's a great setup. I'll let you take it away. Yeah. So, um, so when we talk about kind of high levels of insulin sensitivity, like why should you even care? And so I think that there are four, you know, four important points to consider. So the first point is you're going to get better, you know, you get better recovery because if you're more efficient with your carbohydrates, you're going to get those carbohydrates into your muscles. You know, if you're going to consume carbohydrates right after exercise, when insulin sensitivity is the highest, you're going to get to replenish your glycogen stores. So you just kind of, you're going to get better, um, better recovery. You also get better, better body composition because your body is more effective and efficient at doling out the, you know, the carbohydrates that, that you're consuming. So you're going to get better body composition. Uh, you get better utilization of glucose, right? By definition, if your body is sensitive to insulin, right? And insulin's job is to essentially, I think about them as like doors, right? Insulin goes around your bloodstream and goes up to muscle and fat cells, right? And it like literally knocks on the door and says, hey, could you open up so I could put some glucose in there? So you're going to get, the more sensitive your body is to that knocking, right? The better utilization you're going to get. Um, I think a, a great example of, I think a, a great metaphor, right? For insulin sensitivity and the difference between it um, is, so I have, I have four little kids and you can imagine a, a household with four little kids, right? It's very, it's loud all the time. Like it's constantly loud. And so my sensitivity to noise, right? I have a very low sensitivity or a very low sensitivity to noise, right? I'm noise resistant. Whereas we went and visited my family who lives in Vermont, my parents who now live, you know, no kids in the house and my younger sister and, and her husband were in town. They have no kids and their house as they describe it is like a library. So you can imagine my crew comes to town, right? And I don't even think they're not being loud at all, but my family is like, oh my goodness, these kids are so loud because they're so sensitive to it. And it's the same, like basically glucose is the same thing. Like if your body is sensitive to it, then it responds, you know, in a, in a much better way versus if you're like me and you're desensitized to it, it doesn't matter how much yelling and screaming, like you're not even going to notice it. So you get this, so you get better, better glucose utilization, which is important. Um, and this is partly with insulin sensitivity. And, and what I find with a lot of things kind of, excuse me, with the, with the hormonal effects of food, and especially when it comes to fat loss, it's partly a chicken and the egg concept, right? Because if you're looking to lose weight, right, the more weight you have to lose, the less insulin sensitive you're going to be. So it's kind of an uphill battle. The leaner you are, the more insulin sensitive you're going to be, right? So it makes it a lot easier. So it's kind of like, you know, the, the spoils go to the victor. Like, it's partly a chicken and egg concept because you're going to have better body composition if you're more insulin sensitive and as you become more insulin sensitive, you're going to get better body composition. So the, the things kind of, you know, they come together, but it doesn't mean even if it is a chicken or the egg thing, it doesn't mean you should not try. And so I think it's just important to appreciate high levels of insulin sensitivity are extremely important. So how do you get, like, how do you improve your insulin sensitivity would be the next question, right? So I have five points here on the, um, on the slides. So the first one is body composition. The leaner you are, the more muscle mass you have, the more insulin sensitive you're gonna be, which is kind of what I just talked about. Um, exercise. Exercise is the most powerful drug that you have access to, period, when it comes to your body composition and, and modulating carbohydrates, right? Because basically when you exercise, that causes glucose receptors to shoot to the surface of your muscles and just, they're like glucose sponges. So the more active you are, the better your insulin sensitivity is going to be. 
And I'll tell you, like, with my, my work, like, I, I literally, I sit here at my desk in my office. I work from home, like, way too much. And, and so I actually try to time my carbohydrate intake even during the day based on my activity levels. And if I can get in a little bit more activity, like at lunch, you know, like I have a small gym in my garage with a, with a ski erg, um, you know, which is kind of like a rowing machine, but it's like skiing. If I can go in there and do 10, 15 minutes, right, 10 minutes before I eat lunch, then I do that because I'm going to get that little kick, that little boost in insulin sensitivity. So it's going to be, you know, it's going to be easier for my body to, to process and use those nutrients that I'm consuming. Some people might think that's a little bit over the top, but the good news is research shows you could just go for a walk, right? That if you go for a walk, you get a boost in, in insulin sensitivity and you're going to get a greater, um, in, you're going to get an increase in the efficiency of glucose uptake from your subsequent meal. So it could be as little as just walking the dog and like whose dog doesn't need to be walked, right? Um, the next piece is genetics, you know, fortunate, unfortunately, like genetics, they kind of are what they are, but, um, you know, if we look at, there are five things for, that are going to dictate insulin sensitivity that we're going to talk about tonight, right? One of them is genetics. So you're basically stuck with one and you can impact four of those things. So those are pretty good odds, right? Um, so the next piece is diet, right? So how, how are you going to like how you structure your diet, the amount of carbohydrates in your diet, one of the things that you'll notice kind of the overarching theme of, of the talk tonight is going to be the more active you are, the more carbohydrates you can consume, the leaner you are, the more carbohydrates you can consume, right? And because your body's just going to be more, more sensitive to them. So adjust your carbohydrate intake accordingly. Uh, and then the last piece is sleep. And I would say sleep at this point in my life is kind of a do as I say, not as I do. Um, for, for anybody who's listening, who's a subscriber, uh, to my podcast, the Dr. Mike show a couple weeks ago, I did, uh, I do these shows on Fridays called Friday focus, which is just kind of like a short, a short blurb of some kind of summary of the weekend and things to work on. And I was talking to, to, to everybody, all the listeners about how sleep was really something that I've tried that I'm working on, especially this month. I've really committed to, to improve sleep and it's made a huge difference in my ability to get up in the morning when I want to, you know, at, at um, at 4.58 in the morning to get up and get started and do the things I need to do. But sleep has profound impacts on your insulin sensitivity. So getting enough sleep, and I think the hormonal ramifications of inefficient sleep or, or not insufficient sleep are just, are unbelievable. And so really try to get, um, you know, if you seven to nine hours, eight to nine hours, um, it's so, so important, you know, hormonally. So I think it might be counterintuitive, but if you're, if you're having trouble losing weight, check your sleep because it can really have a big difference. And Mike, on, on that point of, of sleep, you know, certainly that's something that I've seen uh, popping up more and more in, in various articles I read about weight loss or, or improving your health. Um, is, is that just something that for whatever reason is being emphasized more or ha has there been any new research in recent years um, that have really pointed to the impact of sleep on, on body composition and weight loss? So I think that there's definitely a growing body of, of evidence to, su to support this. Like, you know, there, I, I don't know, I'm not, I couldn't give you like a 15 years ago, we knew this about sleep and the hormonal impacts of sleep versus now. But I, I, I know that in the last five to 10 years, it's become a, a much bigger topic and people are talking about sleep and weight loss a lot more. And there is a, a great body of scientific evidence to support it. So really, I mean, one night of of insufficient sleep. So get like four hours of sleep one night and you get almost immediate changes, negative changes in leptin, which is a hormone that, that controls appetite and controls metabolic rate. So getting enough sleep is, is, is really, uh, is really something that you can't, um, you can't discount. Gotcha. So, so next you see the, you know, I, I had mentioned this before um, and you see kind of this picture of, of a saint and a devil, both um, different types of carbohydrates on the screen that, Optimal fat loss targets really carbohydrate intake that's in line with your carbohydrate tolerance and your carbohydrate needs. So when you're looking to lose weight, I think you, you know, there's a set amount of protein that you should work on, right? It, it's basically anywhere between 90 grams of protein and one gram per pound body weight, right? Separated evenly throughout all your eating occasions throughout the day. And so that's pretty standard. And then you would select your carbohydrate intake kind of on a sliding scale based on how active you are. And then also, you know, how tolerant you are. So the, you know, and, and we would just use body size. So the kind of the higher your body fat or the more weight you have to lose, you would consider yourself less tolerant. And so if you were to start, 
you know, I think you're high end of carbohydrates, you're at about 40% of calories, low end, you'll say you're at about 20. And so you use that kind of as a span for where you want to start with your, you know, with your carbohydrates. Um, and so why you want to do that, I want to, I want to show you like, um, this is a, one of my favorite studies. So you can see here, this was a study by Ebling. And what they did was they put people on, and the graph you're seeing here is change in body fat percentage after um, 18 weeks. And so basically the, you have a low glycemic load diet, which was about 40% calories and carbohydrates, and then you have a low fat diet. So low fat diets are generally 20% calories from fat, and then you know, usually about 50 to 60% calories from carbohydrates. And they put these people on weight loss diets, and basically what they found was when they looked at the two groups, like the low glycemic, you call it maybe like a zone kind of type diet, like a 40-30-30 type diet that didn't have a lot of starches, and then the low fat diet, which is gonna have more starches and grains, like because it's just higher carbohydrate by definition. That at the end of the study, they were exact same. I know when you look at the graph, it doesn't look like they're exactly the same, but they're statistically the same. Um, reductions in body fat. And so you could look at that at the surface and be like, well, you know, calories matter, right? As long as you're in a calorie deficit, it doesn't matter what you're eating. But then what happened, so you can see on this slide, it's segmented between blue and red bars. And the red bars are people who were insulin resistant. And the blue bars are people who were insulin sensitive. So you can see that people who were insulin resistant lost a lot more body fat when they were on the low glycemic low diet. So that's the diet that's less insulinogenic. So you're, you're, you know, the, the nutrition of this diet is producing less insulin and those people lost more weight where than they did on the low fat diet. Whereas if you're insulin sensitive, you can kind of do whatever you want. You can eat, you know, a low glycemic low diet or you can eat a higher glycemic low diet. It doesn't, it doesn't matter as much. And so this really speaks to the fact that, you know, it's not just about calories, that it is about the hormonal effects of food. And it's also about how your body responds to those hormonal effects of food and how equipped your body is to those hormonal effects of food. Um, so I know kind of where we're on time, I'll, I'll pick up a little bit, a little bit more here, but you know, the, the other, the next piece why this is really important, I call this the high energy, high hunger paradox. And this really gets at how insulin can, can interplay with appetite and also the carbohydrates that we eat. So imagine this, this is a scenario that many people have had where you eat like kind of a higher carbohydrate, let's just say like a bagel, you eat a white bagel, right? You eat that bagel. And then an hour, two hours later, all of a sudden you're so hungry, right? And you're like, why is that? And what happens, what's happening here is you kind of have this, your body has this inability to manage those fuel sources that you're giving it. So you eat that bagel, right? And then it's, it's, I know people will call it a complex carbohydrate, but in reality, this complex and simple carbohydrate distinction is total garbage, right? It's not biochemically relevant because there are complex carbohydrates like maltodextrin, which we'll talk about in a minute. Maltodextrin is complex from a chemical structure standpoint, but it's essentially just a string of glucose. So your body can burn through it really fast. So you eat this bagel and it causes a spike in your blood sugar levels quick and rapidly, right? It's because your body gets at those carbohydrates very easily. That causes insulin to be released. Now, if you are insulin resistant, right? Your body's gonna release insulin at first because it's getting a signal from your body saying, hey, we've got high levels of glucose, we need to bring them down to a normal level. So your body releases some insulin, but because your, your body's resistant to that insulin signal, right? It's like insulin's knocking at the doors of your cells saying, bring in this glucose, but your cells aren't listening. So then your body releases more insulin. So they're banging on the doors even louder, right? That signal is even stronger. And then the glucose gets out of your system. But because your body was a little bit overzealous and had to release more insulin, it's going to overshoot and too much glucose is going to get, you know, um, taken out of your bloodstream, put into your muscle cells, put into your fat cells. So now you're in a scenario where you have high insulin because your body had to release more and more to get the, the message across and you have low blood sugar because your body has, because there's so much insulin, it's, it's dumped a lot of this blood sugar out of your bloodstream. So how are you going to fuel yourself, right? With low blood sugar, your body's going to be hungry. So what would normally happen is your body would just liberate fatty acids and say, here are the fatty acids, and now you can fuel yourself with these fatty acids. But insulin blocks fatty acid release. So it's like you're stuck in this weird scenario where your body thinks you have lots of energy available because insulin is high, even though your blood sugar is now low, and your fat cells, which are your reserves, can't fuel your body, those backup fuel sources can't come in because insulin is blocking it. 
So that's why you're in this high hunger, high energy situation, right? You have a lot of energy in your fat cells and you had a lot in your bloodstream, but you can't get at it because of insulin and you're really hungry because your blood sugar level is low. So that's, you know, that's what I call this high hunger, high energy paradox. And you get that with poor insulin sensitivity, right? So the key here is you need slow and control rise of blood sugar. And so that you can control insulin so you can kind of and prevent this high energy, high hunger paradox um, from occurring. Uh, and Mike, just, um, just stop you for a minute there. Um, this high energy, high hunger paradox, I mean, what types of folks do you commonly see the situation occurring in? Is this something that, that you know, when you're evaluating the diets of the NBA guys you work with, you, you see that? Is this something when you're talking to, you know, just everyday people, you see that? I mean, I mean who is struggling from this high energy, high hunger paradox from your perspective? So the high, this high hunger, um, high energy paradox, it's a little bit on the extreme side of things to kind of almost to get across a point. But yeah. I would, you know, from my experience, what I'm actually say is just because you're a high level athlete, that actually doesn't mean you have great insulin sensitivity. Because what I've noticed with, with a lot of athletes is there's, we just have like this, we have this kind of constant sugar fueling mentality with athletes that they're always drinking sports drinks when they're playing. And so they're in this hyper glucose environment and their, their body never really needs to deal with this, you know, or become metabolically flexible. So, you know, it's, it's worse in, with people who have diabetes, pre-diabetes, but you see it even with people who are just, who are overweight and sedentary and, you know, somewhat to a lesser extent with these high level athletes and the fact that their insulin sensitivity isn't as great as you might think it is. That's pretty fascinating. Kind of goes counter to what a lot of people might assume. Yeah, totally. So, I mean, I would just, I mean, kind of as like a funny side effect, a side point, you know, I think that uh, we generally think that professional athletes, you know, do all these great things to take care of themselves. And, and unfortunately, a lot of them eat terrible. Uh, you know, <laughs> I was saying, like, unfortunately, a lot of them have terrible diets. Um, but, uh, but so, you know, next I want to show that I think this is some interesting kind of getting with this high hunger, high hunger, high energy paradox. And then how do we control, how do we fuel ourselves, right, while, while still promoting, you know, an environment that controls glucose? Um, that you can is a great, uh, a great thing for this. So you can see here with this one graph that you're getting a 20% a lower glucose peak. So in the blue, you see maltodextrin, and there's like this spike that you would normally see. And then you see the dip. And that low dip is kind of that overshoot of insulin, right? Overshooting and getting your blood sugar levels below what they normally are. Whereas with, uh, with the UCAN product, you get a slight rise, but then it's, it's a lot more level and you don't get that, um, you don't drop below what your previous glucose level was uh, for, you know, for a long time. So that's, and, you know, Mike, maybe um, I would just, uh, sorry to interrupt, just jump in for a quick second and just tell people for those who aren't familiar with the products, just what you see the super starch there on the graph, but that's the carbohydrate in the UCAN product. So it, it comes in powder and bar form and the super starch um, that Mike's alluding to that's on the graph. That's really the energy source, um, uh, which it, it's derived from a non-GMO cornstarch. And it was actually developed um, originally for kids with life-threatening low blood sugar. So our founder's son had a very rare metabolic disorder where he had to be fed repeatedly um, in order to keep his blood sugar steady. And so the super starch was developed um, to basically release slowly and maintain blood sugar and energy levels over an extended period of time. And that's now what is in the UCAN products, which, which, you know, everyday people for health and fitness are using to maintain their blood sugar and, and control their energy. Yeah. No, oh, yeah. Perfect. I'm sorry. I jumped, a, I jumped ahead a little there. Um, so, so then if we kind of continue the story, and this graph is a little bit small, um, which I apologize for, but you can see here, this is looking at insulin. So generally, right, you get this, when you get a spike in blood sugar, you're going to get a, a spike in insulin as well, because and it's going to be a little bit delayed because insulin spiking is your body's response to glucose levels increasing because your body likes to keep things, you know, like your body likes its pH right at the same level, right? Your body likes blood sugar level within a certain range too high. No good. You release insulin to lower it too low, no good, you feel like garbage, right? So you got to keep blood sugar like at a, at a similar level. And so you can see this graph um, at the beginning, that first green arrow, right, is when they're going to take the, uh, you know, the supplement, whether it's the super starch you can or whether it's maltodextrin, which is basically like sugar, you know, it's a simple form of glucose, a complex form of glucose, right? 
maltodextrin causes a spike in glucose, and you can see here this spike in insulin, whereas the superstarch, you, you essentially get no rise in insulin. And so, and this is then during exercise as well. So you're not getting this bump in insulin in response to taking in the carbohydrate, which becomes important when you then look at the next graph here, which is fatty acid release. So if you remember when I was talking about that high energy, um, high hunger paradox, part of the issue was that insulin blocks fatty acid release from your blood cells or from, excuse me, from your fat cells. And so if insulin is there blocking it, your body can't access, no matter how big and stuffed your fat cells are with that energy, your body can't access it. And so, you know, here we're just seeing this slide is kind of the, the, the domino effect of low insulin. So you get this slow increase in glucose, you don't get as much of an insulin rise, and then you get this significant, you can't see the p-values, but above the red, those are showing st statistically significant differences between fatty acid rise in the simple in maltodextrin versus the superstarch. So you get kind of those those differences and you get this great increase in fatty acids, which when we talk about um, metabolic flexibility in a minute, this is like a is a really neat way of, of how you can help help work and improve metabolic flexibility. Um, so hey, Mike, I, think, I just had a one one question on that point for you. How, how did you um how are you introduced to UCAN just out of curiosity? How did it come across your radar and um, was it really kind of the science that you just walked us through? Was that what intrigued you about it when you first, uh, when it first came across your radar? Yeah. So, I, I mean, I had met, um, I first heard about UCAN, it was like years ago when, uh, I met Seth at, I think it was like a perform better conference. Seth, you know, like a di dietitian for UCAN. I met him at a perform better conference and we, and we were talking about it and, and, uh, and I've used it with some of my professional athletes kind of over the years. And then actually even late, most recently is last year. Uh, last summer, I did this event um, called the Go Ruck Challenge, which is basically um, you get like 40 pounds in a backpack, and a uh, special operations guy takes you around on a trek for 12 hours overnight, right? So you start at 7 o'clock, and you end up at 7 in the morning, and, you know, you cover 20-something miles, lifting logs, doing teamwork, who knows? You know, we ended up in the Erie Canal at one point. Um, but, you know, basically during that whole time, I took a uh, serving of UCAN at the beginning, and then I took a serving halfway through, so about six hours into the event, along with some bacon jerky, right, to give me a little extra calories. And that was all I had. And I, I was totally fine. Like, I went strong the whole 12 hours, like over 12, 12 hours. You know, I had 40 pounds in my rucksack. We were carrying trees for most of the time um, and different things. And, and so, you know, that's kind of how I got introduced to it, and that's how I use it, um, you know, kind of day to day as well. That's an amazing uh, way to put it to the test in an extreme situation. That's pretty cool to hear. Yeah, um, but uh, so so here I just want to I want to continue on with with metabolic flexibility because I know um, I'm just for kind of respect out of everybody's time. So you know metabolic flexibility I I alluded to it a little bit before, but so kind of at its most basic level, metabolic flexibility is the capacity of an organism to adapt to fuel oxidation, adapt fuel oxidation to fuel availability. Right? So it's basically your body's ability to burn the fuel that it has access to. So if you have glucose, right? if you're in a glucose-rich environment, can your body burn sugar as fuel? And if you don't have glucose, can it access and burn fatty acids and use fat as a fuel? Right? And, and so it's basically about how well can your body flip this switch from burning fat to burning carbohydrates. And if you are in this, it always goes back to insulin sensitivity. If you're insulin resistant, you have a lot of trouble making this switch, moving back and forth. And, and you know, kind of decreases in metabolic flexibility are predictive, actually, of diabetes, of getting diabetes in the future. And so it's a really, it's, it's probably the thing I'm, I'm most interested in, um, just on a personal level, is this idea of metabolic flexibility and how do you enhance metabolic flexibility. So how can we improve metabolic flexibility? Because it's, I would say it's a great surrogate for overall metabolic health, right? So one, we optimize insulin sensitivity. So we kind of do all those things that I was talking about before about insulin sensitivity and how you can optimize insulin sensitivity. Uh, the second thing would be you exercise in different nutritional states. So this kind of goes counter to what a lot of people have, you know, generally think that, and I was talking about with professional athletes, how they're always kind of glucosed up, right? They're always on the sidelines, drinking sports drinks kind of nonstop endurance athletes are always 
you know, drinking drinks or eating, sucking down gels or eating power bars so that they're constantly fueling themselves. So they're constantly accessing glucose. They're all constantly providing themselves with glucose. So they never actually have to access their fatty acids, um, which is not something that people generally think about when they think of endurance athletes. But can you, act, you know, can you drink a sports drink, just a traditional sports drink and go out and exercise? Or can you wake up in the morning, right? Fasted, unless you, you know, cause you haven't eaten since dinner the night before, and go out and run five miles, right? Or would you totally crash? I think if you can't wake up in the morning and perform, you know, like, and work out fasted, your body, that, that shows that your body has an inability to access fatty acids efficiently and that metabolic flexibility is something you need to work on. Um, I'm not a big, um, I'm not a big, uh, you know, not believer, but I'm not a big, um, I, don't, I don't do a lot of intermittent fasting or recommend intermittent fasting for a lot of my clients, but I think that, it's interesting to see if you don't eat until three o'clock in the afternoon, like, do you feel like you are want to die or do you feel like you're doing okay? And I think if at one o'clock in the afternoon you're shaky and you can't deal with, you know, like you, physiologically, you just feel like a mess, you got the sweats, you got a headache. Um, you know, that's an example of that's your body saying, Hey, I'm not very, very metabolically flexible because you have plenty, you know, every, all of us have plenty of body fat on our bodies that would allow us to go from 7 p.m. to 3 p.m., right? Um, and so that's just your body saying, I can't access those fuel sources. So metabolic flexibility is something you want to pay a little bit more attention to. Um, you know, you want to optimize but not overdo carbs. So, you know, we're talking about this spectrum of carbohydrates, right? Anywhere between, you know, 20, the high end would say be like 50% of calories and carbohydrates that you want to like, you want to reduce it a little bit, right? And you want to kind of, how do you optimize your carbohydrate intake so that you're not, you know, always hyperinsulin or you're not getting these big spikes in, in, blood, in blood sugar. Um, and then relying on fat to make up the energy gap. And so this is actually a change in how nutrition was, was really actually taught to me. So basically, you know, nutrition was taught that you get, you know, the, the RDA for protein. So this, you know, small amount of protein you do, you know, enough fat for you to get your essential fatty acids. So you're basically kind of this low to maybe moderate fat, 20 to 30% of calories. And then you fill the rest with carbohydrates, right? You meet your energy needs. So if you, you know, fill up this, you know, the gap with 1500 calories and then you need 3000. So you eat another 1500 calories from carbohydrates. You fill that energy gap of your activity with carbohydrates. And I think that that's the wrong way to go for most people. And I think that you want to fill instead that energy gap with with fat because it's less it's less insulinogenic and it's kind of more hormonally appropriate when it comes to to fat loss. So um, so you know when I was kind of as I've been working on metabolic flexibility kind of in my own life and with my clients and how do I optimize this and how do I use it and then I was you know kind of talking about um, just a minute ago how I had used UCAN when I did the GORUCK challenge to kind of fuel this long term um, you know event with without that much that much fuel. I started playing around with using this super starch that um, as uh, as kind of a transition to help people improve metabolic flexibility. Because as, as I showed you with the data, it allows your body to access the fatty acids and to fuel your activity with a little bit of carbohydrates. So you get the, kind of that bump in carbohydrates and you fuel yourself with some carbohydrates, but at the same time, you're still allowing your body to access fatty acids, right? And so this is kind of like, it's almost like the best of both worlds. And it allows you, one of the big problems I've, I see that people have when they're trying to optimize, you know, metabolic flexibility and maybe exercise in a fasted state or in a state where they don't have access to as much glucose and they're having trouble doing it, what happens is your exercise output is terrible, right? Like if you're not used to exercising fasted or in a low glucose state, you just don't have the effort. You know, early on in my career, like the one thing that I would like guarantee would increase your performance in the gym for morning workout people is if you consumed a little bit of food before you worked out and all of a sudden, boom, right? You're, you're gonna feel like a million bucks. And so you can is like a good tool if you're a little metabolically stiff, right? To give you that glucose, but create a, a hormonal, a hormonally optimal environment. And then, um, you know, I think the last piece is if you are metabolically flexible, but you're doing more endurance exercise, that it's just a smarter fueling choice than, um, you know, than, than gels or like I even know someone who who brings like a sack of baked potatoes with them to eat them. Like they're still a little bit, you know, kind of a little too insulinogenic of carbohydrate, but at the same time, you're not, you know, you're not going to be eating bacon jerky all the time while you're running. It's very hard to stomach. 
So this, it's like, it's a good transition. So I think it's a great tool to have in your toolbox when you're trying to optimize metabolic flexibility. Awesome, Mike. Well, there's a ton of good stuff there. And, uh, and you know, I know um, hopefully a lot of different uh, information you've presented that can really help people, um, you know, have some valuable tools where they can implement these strategies into their own life. Um, we've got about 10 minutes left, Mike. So let's um, spend this time to bust some diet myths and also um, just pose a few questions to you. So let's, um, let's start with the diet myths first. The first one um, I want you to tackle is really that more exercise equals more fat loss. You can eat whatever you want, and if you're training really, really hard and, and putting in a ton of work, you could still burn fat optimally. What do, you, what do you say to this thought process? Yeah, so this idea that more exercise equals more fat loss is something that, that is very pervasive, especially in, um, in athletics when trying to get uh, people in shape for the season, right? So I, you hear this a lot from coaches who will say, like, you know, yeah, maybe he's out of shape now or he's a little overweight. We'll just burn it off right in preseason where they're doing two a days and the exercise is so much higher. But, you know, one of the things is, and, and kind of, so you see on the slide here, it says, you know, he won't run it off, right? So one of the, you know, kind of constant things that I've heard from coaches over the years, is, oh, he'll just run it off or, or she'll just run it off. Meaning that if, if, they're, if someone is a little bit out of shape going into the season and they're a little overweight, that just the increase in activity, they'll just run, it, run off that weight and it'll come down. But what you see here is a graph with both women on the left and men on the right. And the, the brown, or excuse me, the black lines are your actual energy expenditures, whereas the gray line is the predicted energy expenditure. And so basically in this study, what it was, was every week they added another 20 minutes to the running that they were doing. So the first week it was 20 minutes, next week it was 40 minutes, following week it was 60 minutes. And the gray line shows is if energy expenditure was linear. So basically the more exercise you do, the more calories you're going to burn, right? Even when food intake has basically been kept the same, that's what you would see. You would see this, right? You're doing more exercise, you burn more calories. That's how we all like to think the world works, especially with aerobic exercise. That's why you see so many people at the gym on treadmills because they just think if I just run on this treadmill more, I'm going to burn more calories and then the weight's going to come off. It doesn't work that way because you can see what actually happens is this happens. At a certain point, your body does not burn any more calories. Your energy expenditure decreases because your body just becomes more efficient. Whether your muscles are becoming more efficient, that's part of it, right? Or you get down regulations in other processes, other metabolic processes. So you need to maintain, you know, I had talked about earlier kind of that energy gap when I was talking about metabolic capacity. The energy gap is basically that difference between expenditure and intake. And you've got to keep it closer together because if it gets too high, if your energy expenditure gets too high relative to your intake, your body just starts down-regulating processes. And so you're putting in all this almost wasted effort to burn calories thinking that you're creating a greater, greater deficit when you're not because your body's becoming more and more conservative with the, with the calories that it's burning and you're actually burning less. And this is what you'll find people who are eating 700 calories a day, doing cardio seven days a week for an hour, lifting weights for three, you know, three or four days a week for another 30 to 40 minutes, and they can't lose any weight. And they're, they're literally going crazy. Like I've, I've sat across from people like this, so frustrated. Like I'm doing all this stuff. Why is it not working? And this is exactly why. You can't run it off. You got to keep your energy intake up and you keep your energy expenditure at a reasonable level. And they, when they track together, then you get great weight loss. How about meal frequency? Uh, you jump into another uh, nutrition myth. You hear a lot of talk about you know multiple small meals throughout the day, maybe six small meals throughout the day being ideal for fat loss and controlling hunger. Is there any validity to that? Yeah. So you know the the idea with meal frequency and in uh you know so in my book in the Metro Diet I talk about this kind of in great detail because it's it's a it's a very pervasive myth in in fitness and excuse me, fitness and weight loss, that you need to eat multiple meals per day, like a lot. And, and this was something even, you know, starting out my career, like this was like, like a pillar, like you need to eat more often, smaller meals more often throughout the day. You know, five, six, seven, seven meals throughout the day, these smaller meals. But what, what the research has actually shown is that, you know, and the idea was that if you're eating smaller meals, you're eating so frequently that you're not going to be hungry. Like how could you be hungry if you're eating every hour and a half, right? How could you be hungry if you're eating every two hours? But what happens is the meals are so small that they're actually not satiating. So you're not even, you know, they, you might be frequent, but they're so small that they're not satiating enough that you still end up being hungry. 
And so, um, so a colleague of mine um, who's now at Purdue, Dr. Heather Lighty, who's a protein and satiety researcher, she did this. So they took 200, uh, someone put people on a 2,000 calorie per day diet, right? And they separated it into three meals or six meals. And they found that people who ate 2,000 calories broken up into three meals per day versus six meals per day had significantly reported significantly less hunger throughout the course of the day. And part of this, I think, has to do with the protein, right, with protein. So you need about 25 to 30 grams of protein to elicit a satiating effect from protein. So if you're having like, a, you know, uh, five, six grams or 10 grams of protein as a snack, and you're like, oh, I'm having a protein snack, like, that's not going to be enough protein to make you satiated. So if you're eating a meal and hoping that it's going to make you full and, and have this uh, satiating effect to delay your hunger for the next meal, you need to really up the protein intake. And what happens is when you chunk up small meals throughout the day, you know, if you take 2,000 calories and you chop it up six times, there's no way you're going to get 30 grams of protein at each of those eating occasions while still meeting all your other nutrient needs. There's also actually no evidence to show that eating more frequently has any sort of enhancement in your metabolism. There's one study that looked at, you know, I think it was nine meals a day, you know, that showed a slight increase in thermic effect of food, but it was really the, it was a high, high meal frequency versus an irregular meal frequency. And so I think really kind of upon, you know, reflection and further analysis of that study that's saying that eating more often increases the thermic effect of food or basically the, the amount of calories burned from digesting food is not, you know, kind of not accurate or, or prudent. So there's really no data to suggest that eating more often is, is good for you or better for you. And what I recommend is basically you eat three meals, breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and then you eat a protein rich snack or you have your, you know, your workout nutrition on days that you exercise. So you end up having four eating occasions that are ideally all going to be protein rich. And finally, the last one, Mike, um, cheat days to enhance your metabolism. So, you know, read a lot about the fact that it can be beneficial when you're on a weight loss plan uh, or following a diet to not completely uh, restrict foods that, that you really enjoy and may not be the best for you. But in terms of actually enhancing your metabolism versus just, you know, sort of helping you with compliance. Is there any validity to that idea that, you know, eating a ton of sugar on a cheat day is actually going to help enhance your metabolism? No. So does having a cheat day and eating an <clears throat> inordinate amount of calories, does that provide you any benefit metabolically? The, the answer is clearly no if you're, if you're looking at human research. I think that, you know, people in the past have made uh, – convincing cases, you know, somewhat convincing cases using cell research and animal research and kind of cherry picking data to say that, you know, if you cheat, then you're going to lose more weight, but it, it never works. So if you overeat, right, so it, overeating, you know, basically just eating more than what you've currently been eating. So if you normally eat 2,500 calories per day and you then go and you eat 3,500 calories or 4,000 calories the next day, so that, that, over, that overeating, if you overeat, that's going to cause an increase in your metabolism. Right? partly due to the thermic effect of food because you're just significantly eating more food so your body has to process all that food so you get that bump in your metabolism. There's, there's it's kind of an additional thermic effect so your burning, body's burning off more uh, calories as heat due to the calories you're eating but that effect's not sustained and in nowhere, like you will never find a, a research study and if you do, send it to me because I've looked, that shows that the increase in calorie burning surpasses the amount of calories you have to consume, right? So if you consume an extra thousand calories, you don't ever, the, the enhancement in your metabolism that you get from that is very short and it never is going to surpass a thousand total calories. So it's kind of a fruitless, it, it's really, unfortunately, it's something that we end up just using. It sounds good. Like I'm just going to over <laughs> in this scenario and it's going to help me lose weight. Like of course, if I could tell you, hey, eat this pizza and you're going to lose more weight, like who would say no to that, right? But it just, it, the science of it just doesn't add up. Um, I think that, you know, maybe a more, the more you restrict and the more strict you are, right, the more you're going to want other things just because if you can't have something, then you want it even more. And so I think a, a better strategy is, is what I always tell clients is to focus on uh, quality, not quantity. So if you love pizza, right? Don't like wolf down a large, the cheapest large pizza you can find, but instead, why don't you find like the best pizza you can find? 
and have one or two slices, right? And focus on the quality and really enjoying the food versus kind of this all American, all you can eat buffet mentality of just, I want to just over consume quantity wise because increasing the quantity is really going to have no impact on your metabolism. That was the one I was hoping you weren't going to bust, Mike, but uh, but everything you said makes a, a ton of sense. Um, in the couple minutes we have left, Mike, maybe just kind of rapid fire, we could just take uh, two or three questions from the audience. So I'll pose them to you and, um, you know, as quick as you can, uh, within reason, um, you could share some of your wisdom. So one of the questions we have from uh, Matt is, um, you know, as you were talking about insulin sensitivity and carbohydrate tolerance, um, you know, outside of weight and body composition, are there any other ways for people to sort of determine or gauge their own individual carbohydrate tolerance? So, like, how do you, how can you go out and gauge your own personal carbohydrate tolerance? Um, yeah, I mean, aside from, you know, kind of body weight, and you, you could get labs done, right? So if you look at your blood sugar, if you look at your insulin levels, um, you know, looking at your blood sugar is, is interesting because, if, you know, depending on your doctor, you could have a blood sugar of less than 110 or, or 120, and they'd be like, oh, this is pretty good. Um, but, you know, I think if we're being honest with ourselves, uh, fasting blood sugars, you know, below 100 is really where we want to be. Um, if you can do an insulin, uh, so, excuse me, a glucose tolerance test, an oral glucose, a oral glucose tolerance test, that's, I mean, it's literally the gold standard and have them measure insulin at 30 and 60 minutes. Um, that's the thing to do because it's basically like, it's the difference between, you know, like your fasting glucose is kind of like looking at the sports car and saying like, yeah, this engine, while it's idling, like this engine looks good. And then actually taking the sports car on the racetrack to see how it works. So that's what an oral glucose tolerance test is going to do to you because you're basically drinking this, you know, thick syrupy thing of, of, of glucose and, um, and then seeing how your blood sugar and how your insulin responds to it. Russ wants to know, um, as you're working with, you know, all sorts of different clients, um, are there any general frameworks you use to personalize nutrition based on the lifestyle or, or the sporting mode of your clients? And, and I guess Russ might be specifically referencing athletes. He uses the example for, uh, of an NBA player, a CrossFitter, and an Ironman triathlete. They're all athletes, but how do you, you know, parse the differences in their dietary needs? So, so, so kind of how do you customize or how do I go about customizing nutrition based on, you know, kind of the person and their needs? I, I actually, I, at the most basic level, I look at everybody like, okay, here's like, what does this person need? Like independent of exercise, right? So, you know, their body size, lean body mass. So kind of what are their needs? And then how do we fuel their activity? So people have diff very different, um, you know, abilities to consume fuel while they're exercising. So if it's an NBA basketball player, for example, right, they could drink a sports drink literally every eight to 10 minutes when they come off the, off the court. And so, you know, well, if it's a, if it's a CrossFitter, right, they might be able to consume, you know, a, a sports drink, or, but may, they might not have access to anything because who knows, maybe they have to run, you know, five miles and then erg for 10 miles and then do 700 chin-ups, right? Like you never know, you know, so in that case, I think you need to become a little more aggressive with the metabolic flexibility approach. But I think what you do kind of to, to stay on, on topic is look at their, what are their overall needs, right? Just them as a person. So body size, protein needs, how many calories are they burning? And then are they maintaining their weight at that level? So what are their overall needs? <coughs> Excuse me. And then what are the fueling needs of their activity? right? And then how do we optimize those fueling needs? And what have they, what have they been doing? And then how can you make that better? I'm not a big believer in starting people from scratch. I'm like, what have you been doing? Right? And what has worked for you in the past? Because people know their eating habits and they know their body habits more than you could ever know. And so find out what they're doing and, and how it's been working. And then you kind of, I layer in the science and then I layer in, these are some things I'd like to test and look at to, to optimize it. So for example, I had a, you know, an athlete who never used to eat before a game, right? Eat breakfast, would play at night and would never eat the whole day. And just because they were superstitious. So I'm like, Hey, let's eat, you know, let's eat in the morning. Let's eat at noon and let's eat it at something small at five o'clock before an eight o'clock game. And it total game changer. So I think it's just, you know, it's looking at what they're doing, look at kind of what, what they need as an individual and then optimizing you know, that the workout or the exercise part. Mike, I'll pose one last question to you before we get out of here. We had uh, several on UCAN, but this seems to be the most um, kind of pervasive one. Um, in terms of the difference, um, 
between utilizing UCAN pre-workout versus post-workout. Um, sort of, what do you see as the benefits in both situations of of utilizing something like UCAN that controls your blood sugar and insulin, both pre-workout as well as post-workout? So, so using UCAN pre or post-workout, I um, I find it to be I like it pre-workout. Like if I had to pick, I would pick pre because that's going to allow you to to fuel and optimize the exercise, right? And it's going to allow your body to access fatty acids and, uh, while you're exercising in an efficient way versus if you weren't, and while still giving you a little kick in blood sugar so you kind of get the cognitive benefit. And then if needed, you can literally during exercise just swish more of a sugary drink and you get, you get kind of a, a kick in, in performance. So I like it pre, but I could see the benefit. You know, I mean, generally post-workout, most people, average, average individuals, right? don't exercise frequently enough with great enough intensity that they need to worry about glycogen replenishment immediately post-exercise. I think athletes are different if they're exercising daily, you know, like seven days a week with intensity or doing two a days, then all of a sudden post-exercise glycogen replenishment becomes a big issue. But for just kind of the average person, fat loss client who's three or four days a week of, of, card, of weight training and then cardio maybe a couple days a week, post-exercise glycogen replenishment is not a huge priority. So I think you, you use the, the you can at the beginning and then you allow uh, just kind of food, you know, like whole foods itself that you're going to eat to worry about glycogen replenishment over the next 24 to 36 hours. Fantastic, Mike. Well, this was super informative. It's really, really great to have you on and, and have you share your wisdom with us. We're really, really thankful that you were able to join us. Um, so to everybody who joined us today, just really want to thank you guys. Thanks so much for all the great questions. And uh, everybody, you will be getting a full recording of this um, as a follow-up by email, um, as well as uh, the opportunity to, uh, to get the MetaShred diet, Mike. So just tell folks um, on here, what's the best way for them to stay in touch with what you're doing, keep track of all the great information you're putting out, and also how can people get the MetaShred diet? Yeah, so um... – so, you know, for, I mean, thank you so much for, for everybody coming and listening and for you, Ken, for having me do this webinar. Um, I always am honored to talk about topics that I love, like nutrition. But um, so I think first, the MetaShred Diet, you can actually, it's, it's a book that I uh, wrote and is being uh, published by Rodale. And so right now, the only place you can get it is uh, just MetaShredDiet.com. And that's through Men's Health. So MetaShredDiet.com. Um, my website, MikeRussell.com, M I K E. R O U S S E L L dot com is uh, is you know it's where I host my blog, my newsletter, kind of all those all those things, and then you know social, you know Twitter or Instagram. My handles are both just at Mike Roussel. I love it. You know, let's connect there. Ask me questions. You know, follow me on Facebook. It's uh, Facebook dot com slash Nutrition PhD. Uh, I was actually live streaming my my part of the webinar um, on Facebook. Uh, at the Dr. Mike page, so at facebook.com slash nutrition PhD. So if you want to see me talking about the webinar while I'm doing the webinar, uh, you can you can check it out there as well. <laughs> That's awesome, guys. And uh, So, Mike, thanks again. Uh, I did post all those links in the chat, and you will get that in the follow-up email. So if you didn't have a chance to write all that down, have no fear. You'll get all of it in your inbox in just about an hour from now. So with that, I'm Varn Sriram. I want to thank everybody so much for joining us today. And Dr. Mike, I'm a lot smarter after spending the last hour with you. So thank you very, very much for being part of this. Oh, you're very welcome. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you.